Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers uh, for the opportunity to be here today and to share this occasion with three people that I admire, both scientifically and for reasons that go well beyond uh, the science, uh, influence of science that they do. Um, I, I will talk a little bit about intermediate mass stars. Now, let me start by saying that um, these are not uh, the massive stars that Connie loves and that have spectacular endings. They're also not uh, stars like the Sun that Jörn talked about, or the Sun itself uh, that Douglas talked about. Uh, but they, I think, and probably I'm not the only one in this room, uh, they are exceedingly e exciting stars because they are at that niche in the HR diagram where they are influenced by a number of important physical uh, processes, um, and we can see the impact of of those processes in when we observe these stars, but are not yet so complicated as the stars that Connie loves. So I will be talking about essentially stars that are about two solar masses, uh, the AF stars. And one thing that makes them extremely in interesting is that they are extremely diverse. So here you find stars that are rotating extremely fast and stars that hardly rotate at all. You find stars that exhibit an enormous uh, magnetic field, some of the strongest magnetic fields found in non-degenerate stars. And you you find that only for a fraction of them. And then for a fraction of these stars, you also find extreme uh, chemical uh, abnormalities that, um, of course, it are not necessarily uncorrelated with the things I've just talked before. Now, when you look at the pulsations of these stars, they are still extremely diverse. So just in this place of the HR diagram, you can find all type of pulsators you can think of for astroseismology. Um, and if you allow yourself to go down to about 1.5 solar masses, up to 2.5 solar masses, then even the solar-like pulsations. So everything is here. So I would say that um, the main question is not whether these stars are interesting. The main question is how can we go about learning about the physical processes that underline this diversity without getting lost. And one of the things that we can do these days, thanks to the uh, amounts of data that we're getting from space, is to do ensemble studies. So let me take you through one possible ensemble studies in this region of the HR diagram. So let's consider two classes of A-type stars in this uh, region of the HR diagram, the AM and the AP that I'll go through in a minute. So they are similar in several respects. Um, they have similar uh, global properties. Uh, they both have, of course, uh, uh, shallow convection, but they also have slow rotation. This means that uh, the, the, the atomic diffusion is extremely efficient, and uh, you have radiative levitation, gravitational settling of different elements, and so you end up with both stars being chemically peculiar, even though their chemical peculiarities are very different. Now, one thing they certainly differ is that AP stars have large, strong magnetic fields, while AM stars are generally weakly magnetic or non-magnetic, as far as our observations can go. So you can ask, um, OK, so how do the pulsations in these stars compare? And can, are they similar? Are they different? And can we use that to probe these differences in these stars? Now, what I'm showing you here is the results from uh, test data, so an analysis of test data. Um, and I'm showing you the radio orders for the AM and the AP stars. Now, the radio orders, you can think of them as scaled versions of the frequencies, where you somehow uh, take out the impact of the change in the mean density or in the radius, which is the main impact here. And so you can actually compare like with the like. And what you can see is that even after all this data that we collect from space, and now you have about 100, 150 uh, stars in, this in each of these samples, there is a clear difference between these two distributions. And so one can ask, what is the responsible? What is responsible for the fact that um, the pulsations in these two groups of stars being so different? Now, one thing I haven't told you yet uh, is that the pulsations in these stars are intrinsically um, unstable. That means that they grow from small perturbations and then um, when for some non-linear process they end up stabilizing at, at a visible amplitude. But because they are intrinsically uh, unstable, we can uh, look at work integrals to try to understand whether a given mode of, of oscillation is driven and so you expect to observe it or not. And that is what I, uh, what I try to show here. Now it's my turn to find this thing. Um, and so let me go slowly through this, this plot. So these are cumulative work integrals, which means that if you want to know if mode is driven, you need to look here 
there near the surface of the star. If it's positive, then it's intrinsically unstable. If it's negative, then the mode is damped. Now, I'm showing you this for a radio order of six. So that's a typical, well, it is within the range of the AM stars. And what I'm showing here are two models, one with helium depletion, so I'm allowing helium to settle, and the other is without helium depletion. Now, what you can also see here is that the, in, the, in the work integral like this, the driving regions in the star is where the work integral increases outwardly. So in this case, for the black line, for instance, of the homogeneous model, it will be in this region, so th the second helium ionization region, and in the hydrogen ionization region. And you can also already see that when helium is depleted, the influence of the helium, second helium ionization region is uh, less important for the driving. Now, these models, they have been computed using uh, time-dependent convection that was developed by Douglas many years ago. And it is critical to analyze the stability of these pulsations because only with time-dependent convection you can include this interaction between pulsations and convection, which is important in these studies. Now, Okay, so we can see that uh, for a radio order typical of an AM star, for both these models, we have excitation. We can ask what happens for the other, um, for the other radio orders. So now I show you here the growth rates, the normalized growth rates. So for, the, for two models, again, with helium depletion and no helium depletion, now when the growth rates are positive, you have excitation. When the growth rates are negative, you don't have excitation. And you have the radio orders on the top to guide your eye. What you can see here is that for both models, I mean, so the first thing you can see is that if you have helium depletion or not, that changes the modes that you may expect to observe. So it, this already tells you that by looking at what's excited in these stars, you can learn something about the degree of helium uh, uh, settling below the convective, the outer convective region. So that's the first thing. The second thing that you can see, in particular, if I move this to the next one, is that if you look at the very low radio orders, um, so the fundamental and, and, and further, then the helium depletion has a significant impact. So this is by no means only universal, there are models where the low radio orders are excited even with helium depletion, but in general, the, if you uh, let helium deplete, then you, you, you have a lot less excitation in the lower radio models. But the main thing of this plot is to show you that no matter how you change helium around, you cannot excite the oscillations in the 20s, 30 radio orders that are observed in the magnetic chemical peculiar stars. So what's going on? How do you excite the oscillations in this uh, other group of stars? Well, let me uh, tell you a little bit about something else that has interested um, uh, Douglas for, for quite some time, uh, which is the possibility, uh, so the interaction between convection and magnetic field, and how the magnetic field uh, may suppress convection. Now, in these stars, you can try to do a, a back-of-the-envelope calculation uh, to uh, try to understand if a kilogauss field uh, will or not suppress uh, convection. This is a very shallow layer of convection, remember, in these stars. And uh, that gives you, so V and C are now the alpha and, and the sound speed velocity. And what I'm plotting here is for the dashed line is left-hand side of this equation, and the dotted line is the right-hand side of the equation. And you can see that from this back-of-the-envelope calculation, you'd expect these fields to suppress convection. Uh, of course, you can do the problem in a, in a proper way, as done many years ago, uh, where it was a sufficient condition uh, was uh, derived that I now uh, have here and plot in the continuous uh, line here. And you can see that now there is a region in the hydrogen ionization region uh, where um, the, the condition is not satisfied. Now, in order for uh, we conclude that convection is suppressed by magnetic field, this uh, condition would have to be satisfied everywhere. So since it's not satisfied in one place, we cannot draw very strong conclusions about that, even though we can dwell about it. Uh, on the other hand, this is only a sufficient condition, so it's not a necessary condition. So we can also not tell that it is not suppressed. So let's assume it is suppressed and move on, okay? And uh, then we can uh, compare what is the work integral in a model with convection and a model with convection suppressed for a typical AP mode, so for the 
I don't know, 20, 30 radio orders. And what you can see here is that when you suppress the, this envelope convection, that the mode becomes excited. And it does for two reasons. One, there's a lot less dumping in the OEM ionization region, and the other is that there's more driving in the hydrogen ionization region. So again, you can do that for um, the models and look at the growth rates. And here I can show you both for helium depleted and helium non-depleted models that you can indeed uh, excite modes of the typical radio order of AP stars if you suppress envelope convection. Okay, so we can do this for a grid of models in our parameter space, explore the parameter space, and t take for each model the characteristic radio order that is excited. That's what you see here in the lower panel, and you can compare with the higher panel to with observations, and you can see that the, obs the bulk of the observations are reasonably explained by these models with convection suppressed. So we are happy, except that we are not, because, of course, you can see that there is a tail in this observed distribution that we don't see in our models. Now, of course, the first thing you can think of is, okay, this is just a few stars, perhaps, you know, the radio orders are not well estimated, uh, so perhaps, you know, that's why they don't show in models. But we do have some benchmark stars here, and we did do quite a lot of tests, and so let me show you, for instance, for alpha C, for which we have interferometry, we know reasonably well its radius, um, and even trying to change the parameters around within uh, the, the uncertainties and, and significant uncertainties, so we're being very generous here, we can see that we have absolutely no driving in these models with convection suppressed in the region where the oscillations are observed. So we have a problem here. Uh, but let me hold on to this, I promise I'll come back to it, and let me move to something else. Um, so let me tell you something else I haven't told you about these stars, which is particularly interesting. So these stars, uh, in these stars, the rotation axis is not aligned with the magnetic or the pulsation axis. And because this uh, uh, chemical transport in the outer layers is guided by the magnetic lines, they end up having uh, uh, spots of chemical elements that are not aligned with rotation. That means that as the star rotates, these spots of chemical element will make the light vary. And that's what you see here. This is a test light curve, okay? So you can see light variability on the rotation time scale because of this. But you can also see the pulsations at any given time. And because the pulsation axis is not aligned with the rotation axis, it may be with the magnetic axis, but not with the rotation axis, the amplitude of the pulsations is also going to be modulated over rotation. And that's what you see here on the top panel for an old observation uh, from ground-based. And you can see the amplitude of the pulsation now changing over the rotation. So this is the rotation phase. Now, if you take the Fourier transform, like we like to do uh, for this, uh, to, 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 uh, to study the pulsations in these stars, you will see that because of this amplitude modulation, rather than having a single peak, we're talking about a single mode here, okay? You have a multiplet. This is just the impact of having the modulation on the amplitude. So people can, in principle, use this to infer uh, information about the geometry of the mode. Is it a dipole mode? Is it a quadrupole mode? Is it a radial mode? And also about the obliquity of the pulsation axis or the magnetic axis if we think they are aligned. Okay. Now, the problem is we have the same thing now for the test data Okay, in red. And the blue is what I've shown you before from the ground base. And the modulation is completely different. And also when we see it in the terms of the uh, the, the amplitude spectrum, we can see that the relative size between the peaks in the multiplet are completely different. So the inferences that we are making uh, will be different, right, from the two models. Now, um, this is not completely surprising because, of course, we know for a long time that the magnetic field has an impact on the pulsations that goes beyond the indirect impact through the suppression of convection. So here's the comparison between magnetic and gas pressure in a typical model of an AP star. And uh, 
you may notice that in this region here, the two are comparable. So in the outer layers, the two are comparable. That means that when we study the waves in these stars, and they are, we talk about them as acoustic waves, in reality, what we have is acoustic waves that coupled with magnetic fields. So we are going to have magnetoacoustic waves in this region here. And what I'm summarizing here is just the energetics of the problem. Okay, you can look at it in many different ways, but you can imagine you have uh, uh, you can imagine you have an acoustic wave um, um, propagating from from below, and it, it hits this region, and now becomes a magnetoacoustic uh, wave, and then it is partially uh, reflected back, and then when it comes back, part of the energy will be in an alpha N wave, which will eventually dissipate down because the the wave number is increasing uh, as, as it propagates down, and part will come in, the, in, the, uh, in terms of an acoustic wave. But if you look above that layer, so the layer where the magnetic field dominates, magnetic pressure dominates over the gas pressure, you have something similar. So you'll have part of the energy will be in an acoustic wave that will now be propagating along the field lines and eventually dissipating, but part of the energy has been passed to magnetic waves will be refracted back, or at least uh, they hopefully will be refracted back. So energetically speaking, what is happening here is that in each cycle, you'll be losing energy, which we hope that is being put back by the driving mechanism, but also in each cycle, there's part of the energy that is kept inside the star, which means that you can do that no matter what frequency you have, including the very high frequencies where we observe these, uh, these modes um, that we cannot yet explain how to drive. Okay. Um, if you look in terms of the uh, displacement, and I'm only showing here the acoustic component of the displacement, rather than having this essentially vertical uh, displacement that you have in an acoustic wave of low degree, what you have is that when you go in the, uh, in the atmosphere, you always have horizontal motion. That means that even if in the bulk of the star, the star is oscillating spherically symmetrically and radially, then uh, uh, when you come on the outside, so wh what you observe will be something that is not really uh, uh, spherically symmetric and um, radial motion. Now, you can play around with models uh, asking how the luminosity is changed because of this magnetic, the Lorentz uh, effect, uh, Lorentz force effect on the pulsations. If you take uh, an L equals zero mode for the star I was talking about, the green line guides you of what the, the, the unperturbed luminosity would be, independent of co-latitude, because I'm talking about uh, 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 radio pulsation and here as well. But when you take into account this magnetic impact, what you have is that luminosity is now now um, modulated on in, co in co-latitude, and therefore, if you now expand these in spherical harmonics, rather than just having the L equals zero, other uh, degree, uh, other components of spherical harmonics are needed to explain this oscillation. And when you go higher in the atmosphere, the pattern changes. And so you can basically um, see how things change for a particular configuration uh, in the atmosphere, and you can see that the mode, the geometry of the mode, is changing significantly. Okay? Now, what I didn't tell you about the previous plot is that when you look uh, from ground-based in, 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 in B, like it was done, you are actually looking more higher in the atmosphere than when you look in test data. Okay? So basically, what is probably uh, uh, happening here is that we are looking, in average, at a different height. So average height will be different. Probing different heights, will, uh, you will be seeing um, different uh, geometries. Of course, this has is uh, adds a word of caution of what inferences we make from here. And of course, this is not new because the predictions of these uh, magnetic distortions have been made 25 years ago, the first predictions. And in high resolution spectroscopy, we've seen this distortion in work uh, uh, by several people, in, in, and Oleg has been a pioneer on that. So we knew this was happening. The fact that it happens, that it's so strongly seen in photometry, which is where we can get this very long time series and play very often with this kind of multiplet to learn and to infer information, it's more of a worry because then uh, these are the cheapest observations that we have. Okay, so we need to be careful. Okay, I promise I'll come back to this problem. So let me, before I finish, just uh, tell you a little bit more about this. So there were two problems here. Perhaps the first one I didn't um, put it very strongly, which is 
on top of having these high radio orders uh, observed that are not predicted to be excited, these radio orders are, uh, correspond to frequencies that are above the, f the, the acoustic cutoff. That means that in a normal star with no magnetic field, we expect that these frequencies, the waves just to propagate away in the atmosphere and dissipate. So we expect to observe it. Okay? Now, the fact that we have a, magnet, a magnetic, a strong magnetic field and the fact that there is these energetics that I told you about that somehow enable us to keep part of the energy of the mode, even as uh, at these high uh, frequencies inside a star, justifies that we can observe these modes. But we still need a driving okay, for them to be there, right? Now, in trying to model Alpha Seer, desperately trying to model Alpha Seer, uh, changing everything we could, we went back to models with convection. So let's uh, forget about suppression of convection for a moment. And what I show here, so this is a model with significant helium depletion and convection uh, uh, in the envelope. Uh, and um, basically, you can see that the typical uh, radio order, so 25, 30, are still not excited. Okay, as before, but when you go to these very high radio orders in some models, and I can say that this is model dependent, so it depends on, on the, the mass of your star, on the metallicity and so on, so it's not uh, like every model will show this, uh, you can, uh, or you, you can in indeed have uh, excitation in these hi very high radio order modes. Now, if you look at the work integral, you will see that that excitation comes essentially from the hydrogen ionization region, which is not surprising because these uh, waves have a frequency, so have a, uh, thinking in terms of period, have a period that is so short that uh, essentially you'd expect, if anything, they would be driven up there, uh, given the time scales. And if you actually look at uh, working to grow in terms of the contribution from the gas pressure and the contribution from the turbulent pressure, so the momentum associated to convection that is perturbed precisely because the theory takes into account this interplay between convection and uh, pulsations, so there is a perturbation of the turbulent pressure, it is actually that turbulent pressure that is helping exciting this, uh, this mode, okay? So, um, I don't know if uh, uh, we'll ever un completely understand it, but let me at least bring it together um, to say that for AM stars, the model with envelope convection, so without any suppression of convection, it's not expected, it doesn't have a magnetic field um, that, that would do that. Um, we, we do see... Um, uh, that they work and they predict the correct uh, radio orders according to the observations. Uh, the helium settling playing a role in which radio orders you may expect to observe. In the case of the AP stars, so the magnetic chemical peculiar stars, uh, the, 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 the picture is a lot more complex. Uh, we need suppression of convection to explain the typical uh, radio orders that are excited, but apparently we need to keep <laughs> convection in order to excite the very high radio orders that are observed in the tail of the, the, the observations. So that could be the case because, of course, suppression of convection depends on a number of things, not only the intensity of magnetic field, the, the geometry of magnetic field, it depends on the star itself, what is the, the, the mass, uh, etc., so the, the pressure, the gas pressure near the photosphere. So it could happen that in some stars, convection is suppressed, in others it's not. Uh, uh, it's not. Uh, another possibility is something s still along the same lines, but slightly different, which is, you remember that I said that the reason, one of the reasons why suppress, uh, suppressing convection would lead to excitation is because there seems to be less dumping in the uh, helium ionization region. Now, the other thing that I also mentioned is that uh, it is ha hardest, apparently, to suppress convection in the hydrogen ionization region. So one possibility that I don't think, to, to my knowledge, hasn't been explored is that convection is not totally suppressed uh, and that eventually uh, it might be suppressed only in the uh, parts or in the helium ions second ionization region in this case, but some convection still needed is maintained higher at the top. Now the observers can tell me whether this is reasonable to think, so because one of the things that we know from observations is that, from spectra, is that uh, the, 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 if, if you have convection, probably the, the spectra will probably uh, be able uh, to, to, to detect that. So from the observational point of view, I don't know uh, uh, whether we can um, 
we can we can uh, infer whether convection is totally suppressed or not. In any case, uh, I'll leave with this. And uh, I, once again, I would like to congratulate my three friends, uh, one, two there, one there, and uh, and yeah, and uh, for all they've done for the community. Thank you very much.